Hey, everybody, and welcome hey, to OBS Today. I hope you guys are having a fabulous morning. If you were on exactly at 9 a.m., you probably saw us pop up on the Facebook page. And right as we went live, Wendy, do you want to tell them what happened? Sure. I totally forgot that uh, I had workmen coming to my house at um, well, they're supposed to guess be here at 845, but I just forgot they were coming all together. So we're about to go live and they're walking in the door and I'm like, uh, we're going live and I didn't know what to do. You did such so a great fun. job. She was managing y'all, but also talking at the same time. So um, we went ahead and deleted it just so we could have a fresh start. Um, but we definitely wanted to tell y'all what happened because we thought it was very funny. We thought it was great. <laughs> It's so, so OBS, right? So OBS, truly. Um, so everyone, we would love to know where you are joining us from. And um, also, you may notice that I'm drinking something green this morning, which isn't my normal cup of coffee or my normal glass of water, but I don't get enough fruits and vegetables, I have realized. And so this is a lot of various fruits and vegetables pressed together to make this lovely green juice. And so I would love to know, What's your go-to morning drink? Are you coffee, tea, maybe a juice gal? So Wendy, what do you like to drink in the mornings? Um, I have a little bit of orange juice, but mostly water. But okay. I usually have a little bit of orange juice with whatever I have for breakfast. So fun fact about me, Wendy, I don't like orange juice. Uh, Isn't that awful? No, it's not. I, I don't like, like coffee. Such like a, so. I feel like it's such like a, like a, like a breakfast staple, but I can yeah. never... I can never just drink a glass of orange juice, but that's okay. That's fun. So go, go ahead and let us know um, what's your go-to drink in the morning. We would love to know. Um, and we have a very special treat for y'all this morning. Wendy prepared a message all about Old Testament promises and if they are even for us today or if we should just leave them in the Old Testament. And so Wendy, we're excited to hear your teaching and I know I'm excited to learn from you. Thanks. So you can go ahead and take it away. Yeah, I always love to come and teach. It's one of my favorite things to do here. So the question she's right, we're asking today is do the Old Testament promises apply to us today? And I think that the one that's most famous, don't you think Kendra is Jeremiah 29, 11 that says, yes. I know the plans I have for you plans to prosper and not to harm you, give you a hope in a future. I, we quote that all the time at graduation and when somebody's going through a hard time. And so the question is, can we really apply that today? Because it was written a long time ago in the old Testament and second Timothy three sixteen would lead me to think yes, because all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. So you would think it would apply, but not all Old Testament promises directly apply to us today. And that's what we're gonna talk about. And the way to determine it, it's kind of a complicated topic to do in about 12 to 13 minutes. But here's the thing, there's a framework that we can apply. So we're not saying it's wrong to put on a graduation card to put that, but, but theologically, if we're talking to somebody, is it, is it theologically correct? And so there's a three-part framework we're going to talk about. And the first part and the most important part to begin with is we have to acknowledge that it is an Old Testament promise, right? And when we look at that Old Testament promise, what we want to do in that first step is we want to look at who specifically was God talking to? And we'll, we're going to break this apart in a minute with the Jeremiah 29, 11. And then secondly, what were the people doing at the time? So we're looking at it. Who was he talking to in the promise? And what were the people doing at the time? So if we, I'm going to put this, put my glasses on here for a second to say that when we look at this for Jeremiah 29, 11, at the time God made this promise to his people, the Israelites, they were in a pretty bad place. Okay, they had been disobeying God, worshiping pagan gods. And so God said, I'm gonna have the king of Babylon come conquer you and carry you off into captivity and put you in exile for 70 years. So that's who God was talking to and what the people were doing at the time. And so you think, well, gosh, how could that apply to us, right? First of all, we're not the Israelites. 
Right. We aren't worshiping pagan gods and we aren't doing all sorts of other awful things that they were doing. And we're physically not exiles, right? It's He's speaking to exiles and physically we're not exiles in a foreign land because even wherever we live in the world, we're probably a citizen of that place mm -hmm. and we have a driver's license and we have, or a passport. So yeah. we have both of those. So first of all, make sure we recognize it was made originally to Israel. The second step is that we translate, we, we begin to see if we can translate that over to new covenant believers, that would be us, okay? And so the second step would be, okay, now we're gonna see if maybe we can apply that. So let's look at two things under this, the character of God displayed in the promise that we're looking at, and um, what is the work God is doing? So before we were looking at the people, now we're looking at God. And one statement that I really found helpful during all of this is a lot of scholars say this, that God's promises can be for us even when they weren't written to us. So okay. that's the way we're thinking about this. God's promises can be for us even though they have they weren't written to us. So if we look at Jeremiah 29, 11, going through this second step, the, the word that we look at the character of God here, one of the words is his faithfulness. That's mm -hmm. the word I see. Do you see that word, Kendra, that God yes. is being faithful? Because um, even though he has them in captivity and suffering, he is making a promise here that you have a hope and a future because he tells them you're gonna be here for 70 years but I'm going to bring you out on the other side. So he's showing his faithfulness, but also we don't have time to study this passage, but if you want to go read Jeremiah 29, 11, or mm -hmm. just Jeremiah 29, the whole right. chapter, you're going to see God at work in their lives, telling them exactly how they should live in captivity, even to the point of telling them to love and serve the ones who are holding them captive. And Wendy, one of my favorite things to do um, that I've learned from different people at Proverbs is don't just read the verse, like read what comes before and after because yes. there's so much context or it just makes the verse yes. come alive in a new way. And so just like Wendy said, we encourage you to go back, read that whole chapter because I think it'll just give you um, a new light on a verse that you might've heard time and time again. Exactly. And that is so true to read sometimes we say read the paragraph before the chapter before but i encourage you to read the whole mm. chapter because that it really can set something into place so thank you kendra yeah. so look we've done step one and step two we've first of all recognized it applies to the israelites so we look at who's god speaking to and what are they doing second step we are starting to translate it for ourselves, looking for what does it say about God, his character? And secondly, what is God actually speaking to the people while they're doing what they're doing? The last and final step is this is really the biblical justification part that we're gonna look at right now. And what it comes down to for us being able to claim these promises is our identity in Christ. Um, this is where mini Bible study comes in y'all. So just really try to listen. I think our, our um, volunteers in the in the comments, so we'll put the scriptures there for you. So don't worry about having to write them down. But we're going to basically take a little journey through Paul's letters, really quick. Um, and we're going to start with Ephesians two eleven and twelve, and we're basically going to trace through how these can apply to us. So Ephesians two eleven and twelve says, therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, that means non Jews, by birth were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, that's the promise made to Abraham, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So what Paul's telling us in Ephesians here is the first step to knowing if we can apply these promises is that we... Um, the only way we could do it is through Jesus. But then he gets in a lot more detail in Galatians. So here's where we go into more Bible study. Paul gives us a step-by-step -step justification for how we can apply these promises. And he starts in Genesis. He starts with Genesis because that's the promise that was made to Abraham that will concern us. So let's look at Genesis 12, 1 and 3. 
the Lord has said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And here's the key. And all people on the earth will be blessed through you. Okay. That's what the important language is there. So that's God's promise to Abraham. Another word for the all people is it doesn't mean just Jews anymore. It's non-Jews. And so for non-Jews, if we want to know in the Bible who is a non-Jew, we're going to see the word Gentile. So when we read through the rest of these in Galatians, we'll see the word Gentiles. That's us. We are all Gentiles because we are not part of God's covenant, original covenant family. So now we'll go to Galatians 3, 9. It says, scripture foresaw God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That's us and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. And then he quotes, Paul, Paul quotes Genesis um, 12, three that we just read. So we're tying that together. And so where it says scripture foresaw, um, Paul is saying that Genesis 12, three about all the nations being blessed refers to us, okay? So then we go to Galatians three sixteen. It says the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And that's a capital S. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, Christ. It sounds complicated, but it's, I promise it's not because it's just saying that God's promises made to Abraham were fulfilled in Jesus. He's the seed. So everything he made the promise to was fulfilled in Jesus. All the covenant promises were fulfilled in him. How do we know for sure? Galatians 3.29 says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, little s, and heirs according to the promise. So I'm going to read this together because I think it'll be much easier if you, hear, if you hear me say these in order after those four verses. God made promises to Abraham and his seed. Christ is that seed with a capital S. Our faith in Jesus unites us to the seed, and then we become spiritual little seeds of Jesus, so we then are spiritual um, offspring of Abraham, which makes us heirs to all the promises of God, okay? I know I'm giving you so much, but I hope that you get the big idea. And then in 2 Corinthians 1.20, this is our last verse. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so when we walk through these, these stages, we can see that, that, that we can claim these Old Testament promises as daughters of the one true God. So let's say our framework one more time. Recognize they're made to Israel. Who is God speaking to? What were they doing? Second, Translate them for ourselves, beginning with looking at it in context, the character of God and what is God doing. And then finally, we look at our identity in Christ. And that's what really allows us. So now let's go back to 2911 and do a complete application. So go back to 2911. Yes, it was originally made to Israel, right? When they were captives and God encouraged them with the promise. Um, about the end of the 70 years. For us, Jeremiah 29, 11, we aren't Israelites, right? But we are spiritual children of Abraham. We are blood-bought daughters of the one true God through Jesus. So we can claim Old Testament promises that way. So through Jeremiah, the promise to the Israelites was, you're going to have a tough time, but I'm promising you a hope and a future. You can go back to your homeland in 70 years. But for us, y'all, our promise is even better, right? Because we're not getting promised to go to Jerusalem and Judah. We have eternity in heaven with Jesus. That is our hope and our future. And so when you have an Old Testament promise, this is the clarification that I want to leave us with. Jesus coming, his death and his resurrection, what happens is he fulfills a lot of these Old Testament promises. So sometimes it alters how it will apply to us, but it will apply to us. It just changes it a little bit. And that's why that framework helps us understand how it's changed. 
And um, this is really important when we're theologically trying to apply a promise, not so much when we're trying to give somebody a, a text or write them a card and encourage them. But Nikki addresses this a little bit in Flooded. So if you're joining us for Flooded, she talks about this a little bit more. But I end with the good news is that many of those rich, beautiful Old Testament promises do apply to us today. And I claim them all the time. <laughs> I love that, Wendy. I think that's the best yeah. way to end, just knowing that. And one of the things that you mentioned was Flooded, which is our next online Bible study, and that begins April 12th. And so if you would like to sign up, we'll post the link for you in the chat. And then you can also um, pre-order the book. The book releases tomorrow. So there's a lot of time to get flooded before we begin in April. But um, Wendy, something that you said was um, just your whole teaching talked about Old Testament promises and, you know, right, figuring out what the verse says in context. And so if you didn't catch everything Wendy said, or maybe you want more, um, maybe you want to listen to this teaching again, these OBS Today videos are always on our Facebook page. So if you want to listen to it maybe later this week with a notebook and your Bible and pause it and just really like read the whole chapter, um, Jeremiah 29, or go back at any time, you can always re-listen to these teachings. Um, and that's a wonderful thing about OBS Today that I don't think we ever really say. They're always on our Facebook page. So anytime you want to go back and listen or maybe grab a girlfriend and listen to the teaching together, um, you can do that. So Wendy, thank you so much for preparing this for yeah. us and just even addressing a question that I know I have had, which is, does this even apply to me anymore? <laughs> How is this relevant? So um, thank you so much for your teaching today. You're welcome. It was, it's hard to do in a short amount of time, but we tried our best, right? <laughs> we, we did. And I think you did a great job. You were thank right you. on that 15 minute mark. So thank you so much for working hard on that. Yes. And everyone, we hope you have a fantastic week and Wendy will be back with you next Monday yes. uh, with Melissa. So hope you guys have a fabulous, fabulous day. Bye everybody. Bye.